Hi YouTube, my name's Jeff and I'm the Veg All Guy. Last week I shared part two of my electric foundry build with you and as promised, here's the third and final part of this build. If you haven't seen part one or two, there's links appearing on the page right now and that's really the place you should start. If these links aren't there, try the description below. Otherwise, let's get going. Let's start by looking at heat control. Like Tao, I use the Inkbird PID, as it's readily available on the internet and cheap as chips. I got mine on eBay. PIDs are often used to control speed, flow, pressure, and in this case, temperature. If you shop around a bit, you can generally find a package that comes with a PID, a thermocouple, and a solid state relay. A thermocouple is an electric thermometer. They're generally made of two or more metals, and as heat is applied, an electromotive force is induced within these metals. The one that came with my kit only measured up to 400 degrees, so I purchased a separate one that measures up to 1450 degrees, which is more than enough for my needs. A solid state relay, like ordinary relays, is just an electronic switch. However, where normal relays have moving contacts, the solid state relay has no moving parts and therefore has a longer lifespan. They work using semiconductors rather than traditional magnetic coils, and as such, they do get hot. So I opted to buy a separate heatsink to help keep the relay cool. Again, I got this cheaply on eBay. The PID has 12 numbered terminals, and a silver label diagram shows you how the solid state relay and the thermocouple are wired in. However, it's not instantly clear, so I hope this diagram will make things a little clearer. The power source is the mains in your neck of the woods. In my case, I'm in the UK, and standard mains power is 230 volts AC. Wherever you live, you can buy an appropriately rated PID for your area. The PID itself uses much less power than the coils it controls, so I've included a smaller, separate 5 amp fuse to protect it. An ordinary auto fuse holder can do this for us. The secondary circuit, the one switched by the relay, is much more demanding. In my case, it's the resistance coils, which consume 10 amps of current and produce about 2100 watts of power. However, the whole main supply is protected by a standard 13 amp fuse. And whilst this technically protects all the components, I still think it's wise to protect the finer circuitry of the PID with this small fuse. Possibly the most confusing element of this diagram can be found between terminals 4 and 5 on the PID. Here the manufacturer tells us to bridge these terminals, i.e. run a wire from one to the other. Whilst the first question I asked myself was why, I later considered that maybe the same components are used in other items sold by the same company. So my advice is not to worry about it, but simply bridge the terminals. Make sure your wires are up to the task. I used heavy duty heat resistant flex. It's the sort of cable you might find on a quality extension lead. It's capable of handling the loads placed upon it without risking overheating. Remember, your wire should be rated higher than your circuit. So if your circuit requires 10 amps, your wire should be able to deliver more. These fault connectors are great for fixing under the screw terminals and it's much less fiddly than trying to push in the bare end of a cable. The outside colour of a wire does not affect the way the wire works. The sleeves are just different colours to help make wiring easier. However, if you're like me, you'll only have a limited selection of wiring to choose from. But by adding tape in any combinations you desire, you can make very individual wires. By doing this, you can add a unique wire to every terminal combination. Recording this on your diagram helps keep track of the spaghetti jungle that soon follows. It would be tricky to demonstrate the wiring step by step in such a small area. So I've numbered all the points on the diagram and here's a step by step list for you if that helps. I made a simple box out of MDF. It's a little on the large side as it's deliberately roomy to let the heat out. Hence there's plenty of ventilation holes. The face plate is made out of thin metal with holes cut for the various components. Mm -hmm. 
you may have noticed a third hole. This is for an optional switch. I found that the moment the PID is turned on, the coils are activated. For me, this wasn't always convenient. Sometimes I wanted to vary the temperature, maybe to a fairly low level. To facilitate this, I placed the switch between the solid state relay connections, interrupting its ability to turn on the coils. For me, it's a useful feature, but it's strictly optional. As the face plate is made of metal, it needs earthing. I found a spade connector slides happily under the leg of the PID fixing. I then added a generous dollop of epoxy adhesive on top to keep it in situ. The box got screwed to the wall near the foundry and the mains cables finally got connected. Power from the 24 volt transformer is fed into the box through the DPDT switch and onto the motor. Then the box is finally ready to close. But just one more tip. A small diagram taped to the lid of the box is a handy reminder of what's what. It certainly shouldn't get anywhere near warm enough inside the box to char or burn this paper. Make sure all the leads to and from the foundry are carefully clipped in place. As the foundry rises and sinks, the cables will need to move as well. It's critical the cables don't inadvertently get caught or trapped inside the foundry. So clip everything with care and keep an eye on these every time you use your foundry. Cables in motion can wear out. Once the PID is powered up, you'll need to configure it. This model has a few strange qualities. For instance, the initial temperature setting is way off, about 280 degrees or so if I recall correctly, and that needed changing manually. It's also worth running the auto cycle where the PID learns how to most efficiently control the temperature within your foundry. But after that, dial in the temperature you want, load up your crucible and sit back. When it comes to aluminium or aluminium to our American friends, it takes me around three hours to melt a full A6 crucible. Now, this is slow, but it's time I can put to other uses like preparing flasks and keeping out the wife's way. I like the convenience, the quiet and the ease of it. It's genuinely a pleasure to use. And that's a finished project. A well insulated electric foundry with an electric hoist. Just a few important safety issues to consider before finishing off. Obviously, this is a homemade device to hoist very hot metal up in the air. There's a recipe for disaster right there. So before use, always check over all your ropes and cables. Any sign of wear and tear, replace immediately. Check all fixings and tighten everything that may have come loose. Make sure your pulleys are secure and working properly. This really is important. If something snaps in mid-use, a few smashed bricks could be the least of your troubles. This is an indoor project. Electricity and water tend not to get on too well, so if you're going to build this outside, make sure it's very well covered. Personally, I'd stick with inside, and whilst we're working inside, ventilation is also something to think about. Personally, I always keep a window open. There's always a smell involved when melting metals, and who knows what kind of gases are escaping. So good ventilation is just a good safe precaution. Now, wheelchair motors are great and the gearing means the foundry stays up when there's no power. Even so, it's a sensible idea to use a manual safety brace whilst working under the raised foundry. Even a sturdy length of timber will do. Never leave the foundry in a raised position for any length of time. Lower it back down as soon as is humanly possible. There's a fair amount of wood involved here and the heat from the foundry could lead to a potential fire. However, the foundry is well insulated and from my experience doesn't give off that much radiant heat. Certainly I haven't seen any scorch marks on my wood yet, but I wouldn't recommend leaving the lid open or the foundry in a hoisted position for any longer than is absolutely necessary when running at full temperature. There's certainly potential there for excessive radiant heat, so do be careful. 
With flammability in mind, you'll note that I've sometimes used steel rope and sometimes ordinary rope. Whilst I love the strength and heat resistant qualities of steel rope, I hate its lack of flexibility and have personally minimized its use to areas of obvious concern, such as right next to the foundry. But I'll leave the choice of ropes up to you. Just play safe. It's worthwhile at the very least to always have a couple of buckets of dry sand nearby to dose any potential fires. Don't use water as there's electricity involved. Ideally, a dry powder fire extinguisher should be kept on hand. Placing a crucible full of hot metal into the foundry needs care and position. If the foundry is lowered and catches the edge of the crucible, it could potentially spill the content. To help with this, I fitted this simple bracket guide to the base of my foundry. When the crucible is slid in, its bottom should just touch this frame. If it does, I know it's in a nice safe spot. Keep a close eye on your crucible. If it appears damaged or thin, don't use it. Crucible failure happens, and it's most likely to happen when it's full of molten metal. The design of this foundry should mean that such spilled metal will stay within the foundry and not seep out. But it is possible, so it's best to have a smoke detector fitted nearby and don't go wandering off for too long. Such spilled metal is unlikely to reach the coils as they begin at the height of the first brick, which is around 3 inches. But if that does occur, the power should cut out immediately, which leads to my last point. Finally, and very importantly, I'm once again going to mention electrics. Whilst there's nothing overly complex here, there's some major current involved and that can be very hazardous. So please make sure you do things properly. If necessary, ask a competent friend or even a professional for help. Ensure that the supply line is up to code, connected to an RCD earth leakage device for added safety. Use quality products, ensure all bare connections are insulated, ground all metal services, and protect against wear and tear and heat damage. So that's it guys, we have a finished electric foundry. I hope you enjoyed this project, and if you did, please give it a thumbs up. Please send me your comments, questions and video requests. Remember, I'm no expert, just a keen amateur, but I'll always do my best to help where I can. Please look out for my other videos on my YouTube channel and subscribe if you haven't already. So that's it for now guys, thanks for watching.